Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, first, I'd like to say good afternoon to everyone and thank you for coming to this uh, uh, virtual conference. Uh, it's been my pleasure over the last 35 years uh, to have had the honor to serve the people of Vermont as a public servant. Uh, as Vermont's Secretary of State for the last 12 years, before that I was an eight year Chittenden County State Senator, and before that, an 18 year South Burlington City Council member. During these many years as a public official, I've worked really hard to serve Vermont's citizens in a professional and dutiful manner, always striving to make our government more efficient, more accessible, and more transparent for all Vermonters. I've also elect entered my elected positions in government with over 30 years of experience in the business sector. This background helped me evaluate policies and propose legislation with a very broad lens, examining how our actions would translate in reality and how it might affect Vermonters. For me, the end result of the work of government should always be to improve the health, safety, and lives of all of our citizens. After each election, I took an oath to uphold the constitutions of both our nation and our state and I worked every day to abide by those governing principles. It was, critically, uh, uh, it was critically important to me that the Secretary of State's office operate in a nonpartisan, non-political manner. And I know we have worked very hard to do that. After each election, whoops, sorry, as Vermont Secretary of State, I was honored to have served as National Association of Secretaries uh, of State a President, U.S. Election Assistance Commission Board of Advisors, Council of State Governments Executive Board, and I currently am the uh, national co-chair for the Overseas Voting Initiative for military personnel and overseas citizens. And I've also been privileged to testify before Congress on both voting and election cybersecurity. During my term as Secretary of State, Vermont models for elections, professional regulation, and business registration, as well as archives and records management, were nationally commended as among the best in the country and an example for other states to follow. Today, I am announcing that I am not seeking re-election to the position of Vermont Secretary of State. While I have enjoyed this job every day, I am looking forward to a new chapter next January at the conclusion of my current term. The position of Secretary of State is critically important in the protection of citizens' voting rights and upholding our democracy. It should not be viewed as merely a stepping stone for higher office. I especially want to publicly acknowledge and thank all of the staff members at the Secretary of State's office. Together, we have improved the operations of the office and the services to Vermonters. I particularly want to recognize my Deputy Secretary, Chris Winters, who has served the office for 25 years with the last seven as my deputy. He has been a tremendous asset and indispensable partner carrying out the work to make our office more efficient, more credible and more accountable. Chris has been a vital member of my senior management team overseeing policy and operations and spearheading many important legislative changes. In my almost 12 years now as secretary, we have accomplished many goals as the office transitioned from paper-driven processes to a more efficient and accurate digital environment using online applications and a well-respected and redesigned website. We have, endured, we have ensured accessible, free, fair, and secure election processes while protecting and expanding Vermonters' constitutional right to vote. And we've done that through same-day voter registration, automatic voter registration, online voter registration, ADA-compatible accessible voting, enhanced cybersecurity, universal vote by mail, ballot drop boxes, ballot curing. I also want to thank Vermont's 246 city and town clerks for their efforts working with our office to perform the very core of our democracy, our elections. Our, our office protects the health and safety of the public through regulation and investigation of over 50 professions, 80,000 plus licensees, and we assist Vermont's business sector in registering to do business in Vermont. 
The Vermont State Archives and Records Administration has received federal grants in recognition of the work being done to protect Vermont's important historical documents and to work with state agencies to improve records management and public accessibility to those documents. I also wanna thank my family, my friends, my colleagues for their support, including those who have encouraged and supported me in my career. My colleagues from the South Burlington City Council, Chittenden County Senators, with a special thanks to former Senator Jim Letty, Governor Howard Dean, Governor and Pro Tem Peter Shumlin, and of course, Senators Leahy, Sanders, and Congressman Welch. More recently, it has been, it has been my honor to work with Governor Scott, Lieutenant Governor Gray, Treasurer Pierce, Attorney General Donovan, Auditor Hoffer, Senate President Pro Tem Ballant, House Speaker Jill Krolinski, and many other dedicated and hardworking legislative committee chairs and members. Most importantly, I wanna thank all Vermonters for your support and for the privilege of allowing me to serve you during my 35 plus years of elected public service. It has been my honor, it has been the honor of my lifetime and I am grateful to have been provided the opportunity to help protect, defend and enhance our democracy. I also wanna say thank you to my partner, Annie. Uh, it, it's been a great run. Thank you, stay safe, be well, and please do your part to keep our state a welcoming and respectful place for all Vermonters. Thank you. Okay, we can take questions. If you're a reporter with a media inquiry, please raise your hand uh, either in the Zoom function or by pressing star six. The first person I saw raised their actual hand. So Mike Donahue, you can go ahead. I'll make sure to unmute yourself and ask a question. So was that a uh, endorsement of uh, Chris Winters uh, that you were making? Uh, Mike, as, as you know, I have never endorsed anybody for elected office, whether it be local, state or federal. I will say that uh, that Chris is, uh, I know he's considering a run for, the, for this seat um, and I will deal with that at, at the appropriate time. I noticed he got a haircut the other day. I was just wondering if he was <laughs> preparing. Uh, the other thing, um, why is it that everybody always claims transparency and when they're running for office, but seems like a lot of people get to Montpelier and they flip flop. And for whatever reason, you have, you, you have been actually one of the more transparent people around. And uh, I, I just find it interesting, that, you know, people that have run for governor and other positions get to Montpelier and suddenly they're not quite as transparent and they don't see it quite as, but you've you've stayed transparent. I I have to salute you. But why is it that you didn't waver like the others have? Uh, I can't speak for why others uh, have taken the steps that they have, Mike. Uh, I appreciate your comments. Uh, transparency has always been important to me. I believe that uh, good government is open government. Uh, and, and that's been my mantra from when I was a city councilor uh, as a state senator and, and, and then, as you know, as, as a secretary of state. Okay, thank you. I may have another one, but I'll let somebody else ask. I'm not gonna let you off easy. Okay, up next, we've got Sarah M. Uh, Sarah, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for hosting this today and congrats on the retirement. Um, I hope you can relax a little bit after this. Um, my question is, I, um, I'm so sorry if you hear my Slack notifications buzzing off. Um, we've seen in the past couple of years nationwide a real questioning of our country's election integrity. Um, and I'm wondering if you can reflect on that, that um, conversation that's happening and how that has perhaps changed your job um, as since you have had such a long tenure and, um, you know, your, your kind of statement on that at large. 
Uh, thank you, Sarah. It's 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 it is disheartening to see what's been going on around the country, and I thank um, that. I, I thank the Lord that we don't have that situation here in Vermont, but it does exist. Um, I will say that that uh, you know we we propped up on our website a facts versus myths uh, web page. Uh, it, it's 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 there for the public to see. Uh, and it answers some of the very basic questions that you've seen. The concern I have is that there's this massive disinformation, misinformation campaign going on across the country using social media, whether it be Twitter or uh, Facebook or whatever the social media platform is, uh, through um, the media uh, in some cases. Uh, and, and it really, we, we have to take a step back. Our, our democracy is in dire straits right now. And I really believe that we have to take steps to retake and reset the, de the democratic principles that we have always operated under. Um, you know, I've, I've participated in elections at the local level back in the 90s, uh, early 2000s. Uh, I was a state senator, chaired the committee that actually oversaw elections. And there has been really not a bit of truth to any of the false charges that have been levied nationwide. Um, are there, is there some voter fraud now and again? Yeah, there is. It's very minuscule. I mean, it's a very, very small percentage, like 0. 0.000001. Uh, it's, it's really, really minute. Um, we had one case this year um, that that was uh, adjudicated by the Attorney General's office. One case out of 375,000 votes that were were cast, um, and, and that person got caught. And that's the thing. We have procedures in place. We have uh, the, the processes in place, and and we work diligently to protect those, but also to enhance them. And. Um... One other question before I um, let others have a, a chance at it. I know you spoke about your how proud you are of your ability to do your job in a, a non-partisan and unbiased way. And I'm wondering um, if you can just expound on that and perhaps tell us so, some of the things that you're most proud of in your tenure. tenure. <laughs> uh, well, I think, you know, as I said in my uh, opening remarks, um, the fact that we went from a paper-driven process to uh, a digital environment um, was was the key to almost everything that we've done uh, because we, go, by going to the digital environment, we are actually much more accurate, much more um, process-driven. Uh, and, and, you know, things like, for instance, just in the, in the corporate uh, corporations section, it used to take 15 days when I took office, 15 days for someone to register their business and get their paperwork back from us. Um, that included sending in, filling out the paperwork, sending it into our office, having us process it and send it back. Uh, now that's done in less than 30 minutes. Uh, you know, the annual report cycle used to take 10 to 12 weeks for us to catch up on everything because of the massive amount of, of paper we would receive. It's now done instantaneously. Um, we've done, we've gone from division to division and, and put in the processes uh, in place that we needed to do. Uh, and, and, and this just makes it, again, more accurate, um, more efficient for our staff. Uh, and we've been able to do a lot more with a lot less. And, and I just think it's, you know, one of the things I'm proud of is, is in the budget area. When I first took office, this office used to get 1.8 million in general funds. After two years, we gave it all back to the legislature and said we didn't need it. We could operate off the fees that we generate. And, and you know, that was a major piece to, to give back almost $2 million uh, to the legislature. So, you know, th there's a lot of things in the area of elections um, you know, we've put all these, removed a lot of the barriers and, and uh, made it easier for people to vote. We, we've got the protections in place. We, we went 
from when I first took office being 38th in the nation uh, as far as a ranking uh, for an election administration to 2016, we were number one. Uh, in 2018, we were number three. The new results are not out and won't be until later this year, but we expect to be in the top five at least uh, as, as we go. So, you know, we have made improvements throughout our processes. And one of the things I've always challenged my staff to do is don't tell me just what you what you have to do. Uh, tell me what you need to do, what, what's re required, and we can make changes if we need to, if it's something that we, we don't have to do, that we don't really need, but it's just because it's in statute. So there's a lot of things over the time. Uh, I think we've become more accurate, more efficient, um, and more credible. Okay, next we've got Gordon D. Uh, Gordon, go ahead. You there, Gordon? Gordon, unmute. Okay, we're going to be there with us, Gordon. Can you hear me now? Yes. I could swear I hit the unmute button. <clears throat> So first off, um, why have you picked now to get out? And do you have any specific plans for that new chapter you alluded to in January? Uh, I don't have any new plans. Um, I've, been, I've been in office now for uh, as Secretary of State for 12 years. Um, that's a pretty long time. I mean, if you look back in history, uh, uh, Jim Douglas was 12 years. Deb Markowitz was 12 years. Um, and it, it just feels like it's time for me. Um, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready to step aside. I've been in elected office now for over 35 years. Uh, I had a, a 30 plus year career as a, in business. Uh, it's just time for me to, to go. And uh, my next question mirrors one you were already asked. Um, the flip side of proudest accomplishments. Is there anything you perhaps wish you had done differently? or perhaps some unfinished business uh, you're leaving that your successor will have to address? We've had a pretty good um, um, relationship with the legislature and with the governor, both Republican and Democratic governors. So, you know, I, I'm, I think, I, you know, one of the things I'm also proud of is the fact that we have run this office as a, as in a nonpartisan manner um, that, uh, you know, people, I, you know, I've got, strong supporters on both sides of the aisle uh, and, and all the while while we we've, we've made improvements to uh, the things that we do here in this office. Um, I think many times people don't understand the complexity. For instance, elections administration is really not something that is simple. It's, it's, it's not as simple as one, two, three. It's, 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 a, it's a very complex uh, process. Uh, we have many, many uh, um, uh, things in place, uh, you know, and above all, we've got the cybersecurity. And I think um, after the 2016 election or just prior to the 2016 election, uh, when cybersecurity really came to the forefront um, and, you know, Vermont became a national spokesperson really on cybersecurity and elections administration, but it was partly because my team and I had worked on that beginning back in 2011, 12, 13. Uh, we had started ahead of time looking at the processes that we had in place and how we would protect them. Um, you know, for instance, we do a daily backup of our voter registration system. So if, if someone were to hack into our voter registration system, uh, we would be able to be back up and running within, within minutes because we have the backup. Um, and, and, you know, you have to go in with your eyes open as well, Gordon, because I think, you know, there is no system in the world that is perfect. Um, and, and I think um, every system is potentially hackable. It's whether you have done the uh, put the proper defenses in place. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we think we have, for instance, um, a few years ago, I think it's before the, the 17, uh, 2018 election, um, we had a situation where my IT manager came to me and said, 
hey, last night's uh, log shows that uh, we had some uh, attempts by uh, f that originated in Russia. What do you want me to do with it? I called the Department of Homeland Security. He called the uh, uh, Center for Internet Security. And within 24 hours, they had issued a nationwide alert to all election offices to let them know that there were certain IP addresses that were trying to uh, attack uh, uh, election systems. So it's really about working together, but working also in a way that is smart, uh, that you're putting up the defenses that you need to put up and staying on top of it. In other words, you can't, you can't just rest on your laurels in this job. You gotta be looking ahead. That's good for me, thank you. Okay, up next we've got Kevin. Hey, Secretary, can you hear me? I can. Thanks for holding this event, really helpful for all of us in the media. Uh, I guess I have really just two questions, maybe some smaller ones thrown in. How old are you? Can I ask that? I am 71. You're 71 years old, never would have guessed. And would you rule out running for higher office? I mean, uh, another reporter used the phrase retire. You didn't use that phrase, I don't think. Um, can you, would you rule out running for higher office? Other office? Am I, I, in this business, I've learned never to say never, but that's not my intent. Uh, I'm 71. Okay, so you're retiring from public service. I'm hopeful, hopeful that I will be retired. Okay, can you tell us a few things that you might like to do with that time? You got grandkids, are you a fisherman? I mean, anything about hobbies you'd like to spend time I think on? I, I've got grandkids that I want to get close to. I've got, uh, uh, you know, my family, my, my sister, my brother, my mom is 94 years old and still with us. Um, you know, it, it's, it, there's a lot of things I want to travel. Uh, uh, one of the things about this job has been, you know, uh, many of my colleagues have taken uh, town meeting week, for instance, and they they will go on vacation or something or or in the summertime. And it's really difficult when you're in this job to do that uh, because you're always there's always something going on that you have to deal with. That's your that's your busy time. You don't get to go on a cruise. Exactly. <laughs> I get that. Um, and then I guess my last question is uh, if getting back to the issue of the nonpartisan office and being a nonpartisan person in this office. How do you, can you reflect a little on the fact that through many years, more recently in particular, one party has been more apt to question election security. One party has been more apt to question the wisdom of mail-in voting, which was extremely helpful for people during a pandemic to be able to vote in that manner, as I understand it. And I think, as you have said, how, how do you remain nonpartisan in the face of the fact that the parties in your state view election security and these other issues very, very differently? Well, first of all, I would say that here in Vermont, uh, we are fortunate that uh, we have three major parties, the Republicans, the Democrats, and the progressives. Uh, and and what I have seen uh, when it's election related, we have all come together to pass improvements. Uh, there may be people who who oppose certain parts of it, but but for the most part, I mean, when we put automatic voter registration in place, um, where it was having difficulties nationwide in, in some of the states, uh, we were the we were the uh, second state to um, enact uh, to put a law in place. We were the fourth state to actually enact it, and where we had there were three separate votes: two in the House and one in the Senate. And out of 300 votes cast for automatic voter registration, there was only one no vote. And that one no vote had nothing to do with the bill itself. It was, it was a dispute between that person and the, uh, uh, the, the uh, party member from that committee that it was proposing this. Um, you know, when we had vote by mail, um, we really did have tripartisan support to move to vote, vote by mail. I mean, there were some people that voted against it, but we had we did have tripartisan support. Um, and, and I think that in general, we try to come to agreement. Uh, we work behind the scenes to, you know, at the legislature. Uh, we talk with people. We're not afraid to talk to people. Uh, we reach out um, and we explain the processes. 
and, and I think the fact that I've not endorsed people um, gives me some credibility. Uh, having been run as a Democrat in the Senate um, and run as a Democrat in, in the, in the sec as Secretary of State, but I, I still operate the office in a, in a manner that is nonpartisan. And I think people have that faith and that trust and that credibility in me. Okay, great. Thanks. Good luck with your next ventures. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Are there any other reporters with a question? If you have one, please use the Zoom function um, of raising your hand or somehow signify to me. Okay, Sarah, go ahead. It looks like you've got a follow up. I'm just going to take this opportunity um, while we have you to bring up redistricting. Um, I'm sure it's heavy on your mind right now and is probably extremely challenging considering the timeline that uh, you're under because of how things went. Um, can we just get some form of a, an update or a statement from you on how things are going, um, how, you're, how you're feeling about the whole process? Um, we're coming up close on, I believe it's April 1st is your deadline to get maps in from the legislature. Actually, uh, Sarah, what we've asked the legislature to do is to try to have uh, the approved maps signed by the governor by April 1st, because we have a lot of um, uh, back end processes that have to be changed to meet that. For instance, we have 500,000 registered voters. We have to make sure each and every one of those is in the correct uh, voting district um, as we prepare for the, the votes, uh, the, the ballots. And, and, and then, you have, then you have the situation of the candidates who as of, uh, I think the date is April 25th is the start of the nominating petition deadline uh, the window for the deadline is actually May 26th. But, uh, you know, we have to get that the, um, uh, we have to, they have to know which district they're in in order to, to get their nominating petitions in place. So there's a lot of stuff that has to go. Um, I, you know, we're, we're kind of on the periphery with the, once it goes to the legislature, as far as what occurs, I, I will say that, that the Vermont constitution, when you look at the Vermont constitution and the Vermont state statutes, uh, both in combination contemplate uh, two, up to two member districts in the house and up to three member districts in the Senate. Uh, that's what the laws are. Uh, so I, I think that's what the legislature is looking at um, and, and not trying to rush through. Part of the problem we're having with the reapportionment this year is that the previous uh, presidential administration uh, delayed and, and, and filed lawsuits on, on some of the actions of the, the uh, census. And that delayed the information by a good six months getting to the states. And, and I think many of the states... Every state has a, almost a different process as how they do reapportionment. Um, I would recommend that, that Vermont look at some of these other states to see if we can find a way to do this in a better, more efficient way. Um, uh, it's it's kind of convoluted right now because we have a legislative apportionment board, and then which is partisan, and then we go to the legislature, which is also partisan. So. Um, I would like to see it get to a point where it really is a nonpartisan board. Anyone else? Last call for questions. Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to drill down a little bit more on that, Jim, if I could, on the nonpartisan board. How does that, uh, how does that occur? Would the legislature effectively have to pass a law that took reapportionment out of their own hands, and is that likely? Well, that that's the question. I think, Kevin. I, you know, I was a member of the Senate uh, reapportionment committee uh, in two thousand one and two, uh, and I've been uh, obviously now Secretary of State for the last two. Uh, this one and the one previous uh, in two thousand eleven, um, and and the legislature always has the last say, uh, but I think. 
I think that if we can come up with, you know, I was just on, on a, a Zoom call with an elections expert from uh, Denver, Colorado, just before, and uh, they have a new system in place, which she says is actually working pretty well. You know, every system has its issue, issues, and, and I don't think there's a perfect system out there. Um, but, you know, here in Vermont, for instance, we have a seven-member legislative apportionment board. Two members are Democrats, two members are Republicans, and two members are progressives. And then there's the, the uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court nominates a person to be um, uh, the, the special master, if you want to call it, of the committee. Um, still comes down to it's, it's, some, it's somewhat partisan. And, and then that plan goes to the legislature. And then you have all the discussions in the legislature uh, and, and, and the debate that, that occurs there. So I, I just think that we have to see, we have to, I, I'm a firm believer in not resting on our laurels, but actually looking ahead and saying, are there better ways to do things? Um, and, and I think that that's what we should do. And the way that that would be accomplished would have to be by by statute. But the, the well, yes, legislature would there's have no to question. I mean, we have to follow the Constitution, and then we also have to follow the statute. But the Constitution just makes some broad statements, whereas the it's the statutes that actually make the the um, uh, the details. So I guess my that's my question: Would it require a constitutional amendment to make that change, or could that just be done by statute? If you know, well. It could be, and, and, and in some states, it is a constitutional amendment. Uh, for instance, in Colorado, they had to go through a constitutional amendment to make the change that they did. Uh, I don't know if that system, I haven't really looked into it in depth, so I'm not sure if that system would require us to take a, make a constitutional amendment. But I, you know, I think we should look. I think we should, we should see if there's a better way. Uh, we've got 50 states, you know, we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can look around and see uh, what other states are doing and which ones work best. Maybe that can be your retirement gig. There you go. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you, everybody. I think that'll wrap things up and I'll just turn it over to final words to the secretary. So again, I wanna thank everyone for participating today. Uh, this has been a real um, honor for me to have served the state of Vermont for as many years as I have. Um, and most of it is, is, is a uh, part-time, but the last 12 years obviously as a, as a full-time uh, state employee uh, elected. Um, you know, it's been, it's been really my honor to, to uh, look for ways to make and improve the livelihoods of Vermonters to um, inc improve our processes, to, to try to be more efficient, accountable, and yes, Mike Donahue, more transparent. We so thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs>